Good evening and welcome. We learn from each other and find new and innovative ways to ensure that our children inherit not a culture of violence, but a culture of compassion. These were the words of the Honorable Prime Minister Beni Marama as he delivered his address at the high-level regional seminar on the UN Convention Against Torture in the Pacific earlier this week. To discuss the seminar and other issues, we have with us tonight a range of guests, beginning with Mr. Ash Bao, Program Manager of the Pacific Commonwealth Equality Project. Good evening, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Good evening. Thank you for having me. So let's start off the discussion with the PCEP. Please tell us what it is and what, what it means for Fiji. Sure. Well, you may have read uh, the interview with uh, British High Commissioner Melanie Hopkins in the Fiji Sun on Friday when she explained that the UK has long been looking for an opportunity to deepen its partnership with the Pacific on human rights issues. And recently, all of the, the pieces of that puzzle just fell into place. Fiji has recently taken up uh, its seat on the Human Rights Council, the first Pacific country to, to hold that position, and also be elected as the vice chair. And congratulations on that, by the way. The UK is currently the chair of the Commonwealth, and at the last uh, leaders of the Commonwealth meeting in the UK last year, the communique that came out of that contained really strong commitments to human rights, which uh, applies to this region. Mm. And it wasn't just uh, piecemeal commitments. This was specific commitments towards the establishment of national human rights institutions, deepening engagement with the universal periodic review, tightening up uh, freedom of expression laws in light of new technologies, mm. and even human rights in sport. And we all know from uh, Rugby Sevens what a great partnership the UK and Fiji make together. So the time was right to do a project. So the Pacific Commonwealth Equality Project was born out of that communique and looks to establish and strengthen national human rights institutions across the region. It looks to strengthen the capacity of the state to implement human rights. And it looks to empower groups that historically have been disadvantaged or are vulnerable um, and groups like young leaders, civil society. So it's looking at the whole spectrum across all of the, the uh, Pacific Commonwealth countries. And it's ambitious. The goal is to change the very foundations of human rights uh, f implementation, to improve protection and uh, prevention across mm -hmm. the region, but also to advance the sustainable development goals as well. Mm -hmm. So we started off this project this week with the high-level um, regional seminar on, uh, on the Convention Against Torture. Mm -hmm. And this project will be running until March 2020. So we really are looking to make long-term change. So it's a short-term project, but it will have really long-term impact for the region. And you're trying to make these uh, impacts uh, not just in Fiji, but across the region. So talk to us about the number of countries that, uh, are, that this project is operating in. Sure. Well, it's um, primarily targeted at the nine Commonwealth uh, countries. But the UK recognizes that this is a region that works best when it works together. Mm -hmm. So whilst the focus is on those nine countries. Whenever we have regional events, such as this high-level dialogue on the Convention Against Torture, everyone is invited to the table. There's no point precluding people from, from those conversations. You guys, as a region, work best when you work together. Mm -hmm. So the primary targets are the Commonwealth countries, but everyone's going to be uh, benefiting from it. Well, looking at what's happening in Fiji, what are some of the uh, stakeholders that you actually liaise with? Because a project of this size and this yes. nature would require for you to get in touch with grassroots level people. Yes, that's right. And uh, one of the key stakeholders is the Fiji Human Rights and Anti-Discrimination Commission. And um, two of the sort of goals and underlying uh, principles of this project is that it's demand driven. The UK isn't coming in with the Pacific Commonwealth Project with the answer. Mm -hmm. My job is merely the administrator. I'm, I'm here to be told what you guys want. Mm -hmm. And the Human Rights and Anti-Discrimination Commission is a great example with th of that. We're looking to develop um, a piece of technology with them that's been conceived of by the director and by the staff there that is not only going to change the way human rights is monitored on the ground in Fiji and the way in, and improve the way in which they're able to handle complaints, but it's going to solve a problem that national human rights institutions across the world are experiencing. Mm -hmm. And this is a really key feature of this project. Mm -hmm. It's taking some of the ideas and innovations that are happening in the Pacific, making sure that they um, can come to fruition here in Fiji, mm -hmm. but also elevating your position in the world globally as well. It's a very exciting time. So it's all about strengthening um, each of these countries' national human rights institutions. Uh, we know about Fiji's uh, uh, institution that we yeah. have, the Human Rights and Anti-Discrimination Commission. But let's talk about the region. Yes. Um, uh, for, for countries, you've, you've been in Samoa, mm -hmm. and um, 
uh, around the region, uh, are these human rights institutions strong? Um, are they Paris Principle compliant? Sure. Well, the only Paris Principle compliant institution so far is in Samoa. But there's a real, again, this is a, a, a great example of how the region works collectively. Because there are all these forums where Samoa, Tuvalu, and Fiji, who are the only countries to have an established national human rights institution at the moment, get together, share best practices, and exchange information with other countries looking to establish those types of institutions. But what this, there's an underlying uh, theme here, and I've been very fortunate to work across the region, not just in Samoa, but in uh, many of the Pacific countries. And there's a problem about implementation um, that affects not only the Pacific countries, but everyone in the world. Previously, the, the approach to implementing human rights in any particular country was very ad hoc. The UN system says, OK, it encourages you to ratify the Convention Against Torture, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. This creates quite a lot of obligations in terms of reporting. Mm -hmm. For any country, that's difficult. You have obligations here, there. You have the Sustainable Development Goals. It's difficult. And that's particularly felt within the region. So maybe that's why it's not surprising that this region is at the forefront of addressing that problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're doing that by establishing what we're calling national implementation and reporting committees, which are interministerial committees but who invite civil society, the private sector, the judiciary to the table as well. Mm -hmm. And in, uh, globally, this is part of what they're calling the implementation agenda. But the Pacific is very much at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're developing uh, global principles around how, to, uh, how best to turn human rights into action on the ground. Because for too long, that's not been the focus. The focus has been on the reporting. Right. But what's the point in reporting if it's not going to change people's lived experiences? Mm -hmm. Fiji, Samoa, all the other Pacific countries are at the heart of this. And it's really impressive. So they're developing these mechanisms, they're developing new technologies around this, and the PSEP project is there to help ampl amplify that and take advantage of those innovations. Thank you. We'll be right back after a break. So, Mr. Bao, let's uh, continue the discussion around the seminar that happened earlier this week. What were some of the outcomes that you were trying to achieve and what was the seminar about? So this is a great example about what the Pacific Commonwealth Equality Project is all about, with being demand driven. This was not part of the original project plan at all. This was in uh, response to the fact that leaders around the, the Pacific region are realizing the value of ratification and implementation of the convention. Uh, there's value of at the, the national level, in terms of obviously the moral argument that no one should be subject to torture, cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment. I mean, that's just mm -hmm. uh, an unequivocal fact. Mm -hmm. But also that it pr uh, provides collective security for the region. It makes you more attractive trading partners. It makes you secure in the knowledge that future generations will be able to live without fear mm -hmm. and be able to realize their full potential. So that was the background, so that was where it came from. And it was organised by the Convention Against Torture Initiative and hosted by the government of Fiji, mm -hmm. which demonstrates their commitment to this cause. We brought in experts from all over the world, but it was really the leaders themselves. It was the ministers, the senior civil servants. And what was impressive for me was most of it was behind closed doors. It was a safe space for them to talk. But at the outset, um, Prime Minister Banamarama, he acknowledged the fact that no country is perfect. Fiji continues to experience acts of violence that are reported by teachers, police, uh, within the prisons. There's no shying away from that fact. And behind the closed doors, they were even more frank in their discussions about what was going on and sharing ways in which the Pacific can take a culturally relevant approach to wiping this out. Mm. And there were some really concrete and tangible outcomes from it. And I think my colleague will talk more about how RRT is going to, to take that forward. Mm -hmm. But what we saw was uh, a real commitment from the leaders, and I think that's also supported by the fact that your next guest is the uh, Assistant Commissioner of Police. Mm -hmm. right. There's a commitment to being more accountable and transparency that we're seeing more than ever before. So that's what the seminar was all about. And the Pacific Commonwealth Equality Project is about facilitating these discussions in a way that are relevant to people within the Pacific. And the Deputy Director General of uh, the Pacific Community summed up that perfectly mm -hmm. when she said, what could be more contrary to Pacific values and cultures than torture? Uh, cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. Right. Now, when it comes to uh, dotting your I's and crossing mm -hmm. your T's, after a country like Fiji has ratified the uh, the CAT or the uh, Convention Against Torture, mm -hmm. is that the end of the process, or is there more work that needs to be done? 
Absolutely not. It's, it's really the start of the process. And as I said before, no country has a perfect human rights record. Mm -hmm. And even if they did, there's still work to be done. So implementation is an ongoing <coughs> process. And what you'll hear from uh, the Assistant Commissioner is the work that Fiji in particular has been doing on how to implement uh, the, the Convention Against Torture once it's been ratified. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's about dialogue. A lot of it's about reframing the legislative framework, about creating processes that uh, ensure accountability amongst mm -hmm. your police and amongst your, within your prisons. Sorry. So uh, in, in a country like Fiji, mm. because the Pacific uh, system is, is quite different from European yes. or Britain or Western <laughs> values, we have not just the culture of silence, the whole cultural differences that we have. Say, for example, you're talking about implementation and yes. dialogue being integral to this process. The, the process of having dialogue would be different. How would you go about implementing that in p places like Fiji, given that <coughs> dialogue uh, systems would be different? Absolutely. Well, let me make clear that I'm not implementing anything, and it would be wrong for me to come here and try to implement things, because this <laughs> is not my region. Like I said, I'm merely the administrator. Mm -hmm. The implementers uh, are predominantly Triple RT, mm -hmm. um, which is the Human Rights Division of the Pacific Community. Mm -hmm. But the Pacific Commonwealth Equality Project aims to provide a platform for people to uh, in, uh, uh, participate in this project. Mm -hmm. Lasting change can only happen if it involves everyone at all levels of society, and that's what we're trying to do with this project, mm -hmm. is take a contextualised <coughs> approach to human rights. And what that means is looking at how human rights and, uh, and cultural values can strengthen one another. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm a living proof of that more than anything, because I came here as a human rights defender, a human rights activist. But through understanding Pacific cultural values, my approach has been strengthened. My values, my... Um, my resilience, my human rights have, have improved as a result of, of the Pacific cultures which I've been privileged to, to be a part of. And the same can happen vice versa as well. So we're trying to find these ways in which to link culture and human rights. For instance, one of the most important things that uh, your Prime Minister talked about um, was about violence against children mm -hmm. and how this is a normalisation of violence that is totally unacceptable. It's, it's a reasonably controversial issue. Um, in the Pacific because people say, no, it's, it's part of our culture to, yeah. mm -hmm. to discipline children in a, um, in a physical way. Mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned, I, I spent a lot of time in Samoa. They have the concept within the Far Samoa of talanoa, which is communication. Mm -hmm. So it's wrong. The, the, the principle of communication between children mm -hmm. was always there from the outset. Violence mm -hmm. was never part of the Far Samoa towards children. Mm -hmm. So it's about reawakening some cultural values mm -hmm. and using human rights standards to help strengthen the um, cultural values. So at the end of this project, not only should we have greater enjoyment of human rights, but it should also strengthen the very fabrics of Pacific societies as well. Also, looking at work that's going to be done later on, of yes. course, you've had the CAT seminar, which was successful. Uh, you've identified uh, issues that need to be addressed. Looking forward, what else would be, what would need to be done? Mm. Is, is, what we're asking is, yeah. is ratification just enough? Is that the end of the process? Yeah. Yeah. Anything else that would be in the in the pipeline that needs to be done? Other stakeholders that need to be involved? You've mentioned, of course, the uh, Fiji Human Rights and Anti-Discrimination mm. Committee, but that's just one facet. There's yeah. so many others, especially in a place like Fiji, where you have multiple islands, you have people living in remote areas, they don't have access to, say, for example, these organizations or representatives from here. Yeah, absolutely. And as I said, as it been a demand-driven uh, project, we respond to uh, the demands as they come along. But we're very conscious of the fact that many of the people who require this type of assistance are in rural areas, mm -hmm. access to services, access to education. So we're looking to support projects when people say this is where the need is. We're particularly looking on those, those areas. But more broadly speaking, it comes back to this implementation agenda that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's about taking an approach to implementation of human rights and the SDGs generally that creates a permanent platform for engagement with these groups. So rather than it being one project that says, OK, on this particular topic, we're going to go out into rural communities, it's about the state saying, from now on, in terms of all implementation, it's part of our process to make sure that we have dialogue with these people, with civil society, with marginalised groups, with the human rights commissions. So this project is trying to put in place an uh, institutional building for the Pacific that achieves exactly those aims in the long term. Mm -hmm. So that it always happens that it's not just an ad hoc approach. Well, it sounds very exciting, and we wish you and the BCEP 
uh, all the best in your future work. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. When we come back, we'll have the Assistant Commissioner of Police, Mr. Itendra Nair, with us. Welcome back. We're now joined by the Assistant Commissioner of Police, Mr. Itendra Nair. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Uh, at the recent UNCAT uh, seminar, you were also there in your capacity as Assistant Commissioner of Police, representing the police force. Because, of course, when we speak about the Convention Against Torture, and uh, Mr. Bauer just spoke about implementation, the police force is an essential aspect of implementation, right? Yep. Uh, so, in, in your role as Assistant Commissioner of Police, what is the police force doing to ensure that this uh, uh, agreement is, is implemented well? Thank you. Good evening to both of you and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, in as far as the Fiji Police Force is concerned, soon after the ratification of the UNCAD by our government, the Fiji Police has uh, in fact uh, gotten together with a number of other stakeholders, which includes the judiciary, led by Honorable Chief Justice, the Fiji Human Rights Anti-Discrimination Commission uh, Unit, and uh, there is the Director Legal Aid and his team, Office of Director Public Prosecutions, and the UNDP in terms of coming up with the first hour procedure. Mm. And the first hour procedure together with simultaneously launched with the video recording interview. So the first hour procedure is uh, a pilot project that mm. we have launched at uh, two of our jurisdictions, that is, the first is at uh, CID headquarters, and the second one being at uh, Totongo Police Station, previously known as Central Police Station, mm -hmm. where in the first hour procedure, uh, say, you know, it has been researched that um, when suspects and accused persons are taken into custody, that within the first hour, that's the most vulnerable time when uh, they can be, you know, sort of uh, uh, ill-treated or manhandled, etc. So that's when the first hour procedure requires us for any arrestable offense, whether that be criminal or traffic, we should ensure that we pick up the phone as soon as we get the person in these two jurisdictions only now. Uh, pick up our phones and give a call to the director legal aid and his team. Uh, and, and, and they are tremendous in assisting uh, the police in terms of how it gets worked out. And they are there on standby and they come and provide that legal and then, uh, you know, that lawyer and a client kind of right. consultation, mm -hmm. counseling uh, the client in terms of what should be done. So that's the first hour procedure that we have done. Taking it a step further, we have introduced the video recording interview. We also went and learned uh, some best international practices from UK. A uh, number of trips have been made there. So you, we are partnering with uh, UK police in this regards. So the video recording interview, the SOP has been dished out and at these two uh, jurisdictions we are recording video recording interviews of our suspects mm -hmm. in, in the hope that it takes away that element of uh, bad influence mm -hmm. and, and uh, manhandling or, or not uh, taking care of our, of our suspects and accused persons. Mm -hmm. So just to make the whole process more transparent. Exactly. And that's the whole idea. And apart from that, there are a number of other uh, processes and systems that we have in place which also ensures that uh, the suspects that we take into custody are looked, uh, looked after well. Mm -hmm. uh, first and foremost, we have also introduced the forensics capability. Once when you empower your police officers and the police officers have uh, a lot of resources to work with, it doesn't frustrate them. And if you place a lot of burden upon them, mm -hmm. it, you know, uh, we are going from 3,000 to 7,000 in terms of our increase in manpower. Mm -hmm. And there will be much more equal distribution of crime files. Mm -hmm. So that's another way of ensuring the police officers are looked after well, they are resourced well in terms of functioning well. Eh? And, and, and the government has taken good care of this. They have provided us with a lot of resources. The pay has been uh, increased. Uh, vehicles have been provided. and So a number of resources has been provided to this. Uh, so we are hopeful that in time to come, with uh, all these things uh, given by the government to us, we should be able to bring about that professionalism mm -hmm. in looking after the interests of the suspects and the accused persons. So that's looking at implementation of uh, what's come out, the outcomes of the UNCAT seminar. There's issues that everyday Fijians do still go on about, and it's wonderful to know that the one-hour procedure has been implemented in two 
of your uh, station so far, that there's also going to be um, video recording happening. But what about what happens after that? Now, that's all well and wonderful that in the beginning stages of arrest and detainment that you have uh, some sort of transparency. What happens, say, for example, overnight? There's, there's concern there that will, you know, best practices be continued throughout during detainment of uh, those who were arrested? Yeah, that's where we, 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 we step in with, and, and at all times, all the police officers are trained well. Mm. And, and uh, through this UNCAD too, uh, we have, uh, in fact, come up with our use of force policy. Mm -hmm. A use of force uh, policy, best situation, it directs you that how you should be able to deal with a particular situation. So that sensitization in terms of uh, use of force and how to look after and, and uh, take good care of our suspects and, and all these things are given out to the police officers. Mm -hmm. That doesn't take away that part and I think it is, it is out there in the public domain mm -hmm. that some of our officers isolated incidents, they have not acted in accordance with the SOP and the rules and regulations, uh, rules of engagement of the organization and they've been taken to task for that. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, you know, as much as we want, uh, the organization is something that it doesn't condone, uh, you know, police brutality, it doesn't, uh, uh, you know, it's not institutionalized within the organization, mm -hmm. but, you know, there are isolated incidents, it's individual's responsibility, if they do it, mm -hmm. they face the consequences of their act. That, that's wonderful to know, especially given that the, the, fully, the police force rather has uh, an integral role to play in the implementation mm. of, uh, of CAT around the country. Now you yeah. have uh, rural posts, you have uh, police posts, you have community posts and all of that. And it's not just in the centralized areas, it's also in the rural areas where you have yep. majority of these uh, uh, incidents that happen that are not uh, reported. Yeah, that's true. And, and, and once when you have rural, uh, you know, mentioned uh, rural areas and uh, rural police stations and all those things, we are hopeful because we are already there. Mm -hmm. Our footprint is already out there in the rural areas and police posts and police stations. And we are hopeful that if Director Legal Aid and his team mm -hmm. are able to pair with us in these places here, yeah. then we can be able to decentralize this pilot project in these locations as well. Mm -hmm. Because for the procedure to work, lawyers need to be able exactly. to Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, have you received any reports recently of uh, brutality or torture? Nothing against the police, but let me just also come up with uh, this fact that there have been a number of incidents also uh, for, for, for all of us all to, to understand that police, Fiji Police Force is still very much an unarmed institution. We don't carry arms with us. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have with us is just merely maybe a baton or a truncheon. That's what we have. And there have been a number of incidents. Just recently one at Vatuanga, Daya Street, where one of our officers was assisting a civilian who came to complain that he has been robbed and the suspects are hanging around a Chinese shop. Our officer attended to it and was in the process of handcuffing when the police officer was attacked by others who were, who were accomplices of this individual here. He was assaulted very badly. He, he, he got swollen uh, lips, mouth and eyes all bashed up and uh, the, 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 the handcuff was also taken away from him and, and uh, he ended up, uh, you know, uh, taken to the hospital mm -hmm. and the suspect basically escaped. So, you know, in these situations we are also looking at how best we can be able to arm our officers mm -hmm. so that, uh, you know, as I have mentioned uh, earlier, better resourcing our officers. And there have been a number of incidents and I think you are aware that in Nambua the police vehicle was uh, attacked mm -hmm. when it was uh, pursuing uh, a number of culprits armed with kind knives and uh, bottles and stones and pelted mm -hmm. the police uh, driver and the police vehicle. The police vehicle sustained damages, windscreens were broken and all those things. So it's an issue of, you know, the use of reasonable force at the same time, which is supposed to be, or rather which is given to the police officers. So us being an unarmed institution, we are also wanting to equip our police officers in terms of using some sort of chemical uh, you know, irritants, mm -hmm. uh, which we call it pepper spray. And we are in the process of that. Uh, the commissioner has endorsed it so that we better resource our officers to be able to deal with that. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a great discussion and good to know that uh, the police force is doing a lot of work on implementing uh, these things at the ground level in all areas of Fiji. We wish you all the best in your work. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. We'll be right back after a break.
Welcome back. We're now joined by Rose Martin, Senior Human Rights Advisor at the SPC and also part of the Regional Rights Resource Team or Triple RT as they like to call it. So welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, please explain to us what this uh, uh, the Regional Rights Resource Team is, what is its mandate and um, what are your aims? Thank you. Um, so the Regional Rights Resource Team, or Triple RT for short, is the human rights program of SPC. And our mandate is to build a culture of human rights in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. uh, we're based here in Fiji and we work across other Pacific Island countries. Our primary um, agencies that we work with in the countries are governments. So we work with uh, governments, we work with the judiciary, uh, we also work with civil society organizations in our effort to build the culture of human rights across the region. And that is how our involvement is with the UN treaties and with the UN CAT. In fact, that's what I wanted to know, uh, this whole dynamic, because we had Mr. Bao on the show earlier. And you were also part of the seminar. Yes. Um, were you playing a role in the seminar? Were you observing? Were you making submissions? So we partnered with uh, the... Convention Against Torture Initiative and also with the Universal Rights Group. Uh, so we are the Pacific partner in this initiative okay. supported through the uh, Pacific e Commonwealth Equality Project. Um, so basically we help with organizing as well as facilitating the uh, seminar and giving the Pacific perspective and getting our participants from the Pacific to engage in this uh, seminar. Now, given your work in the Pacific, you'd have a better understanding of dialogue and work that is happening on the ground. And something like the uh, CAT seminar that, that had happened, it's important to always voice the concerns of the people of the Pacific, because you can have people from anywhere around the Western society coming in and trying to implement or enforce uh, certain things. But if it's not uh, some viable for us in the Pacific, then that could be a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, what were some of the... Uh, things that you think that do need to be highlighted when we are implementing CAT? Uh, I think solutions for issues of the Pacific, in the Pacific, needs to be created, mm -hmm. cultivated by Pacific Islanders themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, Triple RT is placed within a very unique position in that all of our, I'd say probably 99% of our staff are from the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And so what we, what underpins our work is getting the Pacific to come up with solutions for the problems that it face. Mm -hmm. um, and so our role in engaging uh, the different parts of society with the international community in terms of trying to come up with a Pacific solution to Pacific problems. Mm -hmm. So basically our work, that is what underpins it. So we're very much giving uh, serious attention to our culture, our religious beliefs and that, mm. and incorporating it in the building of a human rights culture in the Pacific. So what kind of activities do you get involved in? Um, we have dialogues with parliamentarians. Of course, we need political will to move a lot of this work. We work with uh, judges and magistrates mm. in talking about human rights and that in uh, giving them information for them to carry out their work. We work, uh, do some work with the police as well. Mm -hmm. And not only with government agencies and institutions, but we do work with civil society organizations. Mm -hmm. Because it's all well and good that we, you know, go and ratify or sign up to these international mm -hmm. treaties, come up with government policies, but if it doesn't mean anything to the person, ordinary person on the street or in the village, it doesn't really achieve its ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. So we're also getting the government together with civil society organization to dialogue and to do it the Pacific way, the Talanoa and mm -hmm. all that. Uh, so we have another project that's called the uh, Pacific Partner, uh, Pacific People Advancing Change. So it's about creating the dialogue between government, civil society organization who most, you know, represent people in the grassroots to get the issues from the grassroots to the government's agenda. Well, certainly uh, interesting. Uh, in relation to the recent uh, seminar that was held earlier this week, um, we've heard that there were some certain commitments made. Mm. Um, would you hail this a success? And let's talk about some of those commitments. Absolutely. We were really uh, happy to see that the countries are coming up uh, because our work is demand-driven. 
we respond to what the countries tell us, what they need, and then we go, we facilitate and c g help them find the solution for their problems. So it's really good to see after the seminar, countries are coming up and telling us, we want to ratify CAT. We want to, you know, help train, you know, different parts of the government, build up intergovernment agency mechanism that will help us talk to the different government agencies in order for us to implement CAT, especially for those countries that have ratified it. Um, so a lot of countries have come up. We've identified some concrete next steps, mm -hmm. and we are really happy that this is what's going to inform the specific next steps of the project. So like my, Ash, uh, my um, colleague Ash mentioned uh, that you know this project is uh, demand-driven and responds to do mm -hmm. the issues that the countries identify. It falls within the way we work. And how is the RRRT going to support the commitments that have been made? So uh, providing technical support uh, to uh, government when they want to develop their cabinet submissions, mm -hmm. uh, so the process that they need to go through consultations in country, we're there to help them with technical support, ex getting also the international experts to explain what this um, convention is about. and. What does it mean for the government? What are the obligations in that? So that the government doesn't go and you know, sign up to something that it doesn't really understand well. Mm -hmm. So providing that information and clarification throughout that process before the government ratifies and in that process engaging civil society organizations. So those are some of the things, but we rely very much on the countries to take the lead and we provide the support. Now, with all the implementation work that goes on, with dialogue, what have you identified as mo one of the, or at least some of the major challenges or barriers? Mm. I think, uh, you know, one of the common things that always come up is our culture. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, you're, you're talking about human rights, you're bringing a foreign concept into the way, the normal way we live, you know, our culture, it erodes our culture, our way of life and that. Uh, I think well, my response to that would be uh, it, it, the way it's been put across is if you take human rights, you let go of your culture. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really work that way. You can mm -hmm. have both. Mm -hmm. uh, and the thing that we try to promote is let's take the best of both worlds, embrace that to make sure right. that we have uh, a society that reflects the principles and the values of our culture, which is love protection, you know, looking after our vulnerable people and that. So these are the very same values of human rights as well. So how do we infuse those good values and use them to better our lives? So I think, you know, we do have that issue of, you know, culture and human rights, but this is the way we're going about getting that happen, the dialogue to make sure that people themselves mm. come up with the kind of solutions that they see fit. Thank you. We'll be right back after a break. So Rose, um, let's talk about this dynamic that you're exploring between um, for the nexus to find the nexus between culture and human rights. Um, how do you see human rights in relation to culture and tradition? Okay, so as I explained earlier, um, there are certain aspects of our culture that resonate with human rights, and these are the things that we want to explore, and the, because these are the things that people relate to, that people use. Of course, there are parts of our culture that you know we want to change and. I think there was a very interesting comment that was made in the uh, speech that was delivered at USP last year by the former um, High Commissioner for Human Rights, where he says that cultures are um, stronger when they um, recognize and resolve injustice, mm -hmm. and um, culture is strong when it's renewable. So. When we talk about culture, it's not something that's static, as all of us know. Mm -hmm. So we renew our culture. We get in good things that help you know, improve our life and make everyone live together uh, peacefully. So those are the kind of things that we're exploring. One of our projects is looking at education um, and human rights, so human rights in education, or social citizenship, we call it. And one of the first things that we did was, was a cultural mapping. So looking at what are the country's folklore, stories, mm. songs, chants, and things like that, and get the content of that and see which ones of those promote the values of human rights. 
So, so an integrative approach to it. Yes. So, and the thing is, I guess that's the, one of the reasons why people uh, have this opinion or idea that you know, human rights is a foreign concept and you're you know, trying to force it on us. The thing is, it doesn't, it doesn't come across that way. In reality, it is talking about us living together peacefully, treating each other with love and care and respect and all that. So in our culture, we do have that. And you know, it comes out in these songs and chants and folklore. And so that's where we're going to do the cultural mapping mm -hmm. to bring that and to say to people, this is exactly what human rights is about. Mm -hmm. This is what we're promoting. So if you have any issues, this is the way to go in terms of finding solutions. Well, given that culture and tradition, uh, they go hand in hand, but they are different. Culture, of course, is fluid. So to introduce these concepts uh, would obviously be a little easier once you make it more palatable to those in the Pacific. Absolutely. So I think that's also another reason why for delving into culture, because people you know, know about mm -hmm. culture, it's something that's with them and in them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the reasons why we take this approach. And also, to, uh, we do not have the answers. Our projects do not have the answers. So through the Talanoa, through the dialogue, is where people come up with the answers. So we play a facilitating role in this process. I guess uh, yeah, uh, you're completely right in that because for this to work and for it to be implemented in the best way, you need to ensure that all of this dialogue uh, is uh, dominated by Pacific voices, right? Um, how are you going to do that? So um, as I mentioned, our primary beneficiaries, uh, you know, partners, uh, Pacific governments and Pacific people, and these are the people that we engage. We bring in international experts to, you know, help us understand what's happening at the international level and find what are the, you know, things that we can use from th those experiences to enhance and improve the way we address our, our issues and come up with solutions. But the thing is, it's Pacific people, it's, you know, mm -hmm. These, these are the people that are having that discussion, the dialogue, the, tala, the Talanoa. So when you were doing your work with Mr. Bao and his organization, how would you move forward in implementing uh, work that needs to be carried out? So um, the, the project, the Pacific Commonwealth Equality Project, is, f is implemented by Triple R T. Mm -hmm. So we are the ones who carry out that. So, like so in a sense, you tell them what needs to be exactly, done. Exactly, and that's what he, he mentioned earlier. So we tell him what to do. He's, he's administrating the project. But in terms of carrying out the work on the ground, it's us, the staff, the Pacific Islanders, are the ones who are taking this project and the activities with people on the ground. Undertaking something like that would, of course, be a mammoth task across the Pacific. You would need resources. Uh, would you be able to tell us whether or not you have resources coming in from uh, outside stakeholders to help carry work forward for you? Well, perhaps certain commitments were made at the seminar. Um, yeah, I think uh, in Triple RT's work, we are very lucky to be supported by the government of Australia through DFAT. Uh, we also are supported by the uh, government of Sweden um, and the Commonwealth uh, Project and as well as from EU and I'd like to say thank you to our uh, donors as well for enabling us to carry out this work and the other thing too is that these changes that we are working towards are things that do not happen overnight mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it takes you know a while for for us to get to achieve some of the things that we've set ourselves to achieve because I've, I personally have always considered you know, universality and cultural relativism to be on opposite sides of the spectrum. So it's very innovative and it's very interesting and I wish you all the best and we wish SPC all the best in its work. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. so much for joining us. Thank you. That's all we have for you tonight. Join us again next week. Good evening. <laughs>